Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, we are very happy and excited and privileged to have with us today Professor Carol McGrannan, uh, who is a Tibetan and an anthropologist of Tibet and the Himalayas, and uh, doing some of the most exciting work on Tibet that is available in current scholarship. Um, Professor McGrannan has very kindly agreed to uh, give this first lecture in our Introduction to Contemporary Tibet um, course that we are running here at IIT Madras. And she will be speaking to us um, about uh, the Tibetan struggle, centering her work on the Chushigan book. Over to you, Carol. Okay. Uh, well, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me um, to come and to speak with you and share my research. It's it's really a pleasure to be here. If you can see behind me, it's actually nighttime here. It's 930 in the evening on Tuesday. So I am behind you all, um, but I'm going to try and be lively. I have not drank any coffee, though, because then I'll be up all night. Um, but so anyways, it's it's really a pleasure to meet with you. Um, one of my favorite things to do is to travel um, around the world to different countries and not just meet with other scholars, but meet with students, including students who are learning right about Tibet for the first time. So I am both uh, an anthropologist and a historian. So what I'm going to, going to share with you today is research from both disciplines. And I will um, explain kind of in the talk how it is that all of my research um, is both anthropological and historical at the same time, or kind of in other words, history and culture go together. All right, so I have some images that I'm going to share. And let me share my screen so that you can kind of see some visuals and see some people as I'm talking. And give me just one second. Let's get this. Um, let me get into the slideshow. How's it set? Hmm. Still in, hold on, it's not in the view I want. Of course. Um, just a second. Here we go. Okay, <laughs> sorry, there's always that awkward moment of trying to get your technology to work. Okay, so the official title for my talk today will be Fighting for Tibet, Histories and Memories of the Chushigandru Army. And I'd like you to, to file away just for right now um, the word memory in addition to the word history. And that could be something that you just start thinking about. Um, you know, what's the relationship between history and memory? Why is it that what I want to talk about is not just histories of the army, but also memories of them? All right. So let's start. So here, right here on this very first slide, you see a group of soldiers uh, from the Chushigandru army. So this photo was taken uh, roughly sometime in the 1950s, and hopefully you can see by their clothing, actually they're wearing Tibetan robes. Um, and if you zoom in, if you can, you will see that the weapons they carry um, are actually quite antiquated. They're old Enfield rifles that basically date back to kind of like the turn of the century. And by that, I mean 19th to 20th century and weapons that were most likely purchased from British India. Um, so the weapons that these soldiers had, just starting right here, the visual that you have before you, um, might give you a sense of what they were up against in terms of fighting the very modern, very well-equipped, and extremely numerous People's Liberation Army of the Chinese um, People's Republic. So where I've taken you immediately is into the 1950s. And this was the time, basically, when Tibet lost its independence, right, or lost its sovereignty, its governance of itself as an independent country. Um, I like to say that this is actually incredibly ironic in some ways, because as much of the world, right, including your own country, India, was achieving independence after a long period, right, of colonization, Tibet became a colony at that exact moment when so many other countries were going through decolonization, right, and demanding independence. So there's that tension right there, a very different story, right, than the story of India. So what happens? Um, basically, 1949, right, Mao and the People's Liberation Army kind of cross the border 
um, enter into Tibet, cross the Drichu River, and start marching toward Lhasa. One of the very first things that Chairman Mao said he was going to do when his communist army defeated Chiang Kai-shek's uh, Republican army was to liberate Tibet. And I, you can see I put that in air quotes. Um, because the question is, what did Tibet need to be liberated from? And what China claimed at the time was that it needed to be liberated from imperialists, although there were literally, like you can count them on just one hand, the number of Englishmen, um, and I believe pretty much all men, who were actually in Tibet at the time, uh, mostly serving as telegraph operators, you know, who had been hired by the Tibetan government to do that labor. There were also some missionaries there as well. But really, the number of foreigners in Tibet was very, very small. And the largest number of foreigners, you know, would have been folks from nearby countries, people from China, people from Nepal, people from India. Um, certainly not European or American um, imperialists at the time. That was a super, super low number. But that was one of the things that Mao proclaimed Tibet needed to be liberated from. The other was feudalism, right? And so how do you liberate yourself from feudalism, right, through socialism? So the idea was that China was going to invade was going to turn Tibet from um, what it considered to be a backward feudal society into a modern socialist society. That would also, of course, include the elimination of religion. Because if there's one thing we might all collectively know about communism, it's the belief that religion is the opiate of the masses, right? So in general, historically, communism, right? Socialism as political ideologies have not been friends, right? With, with religion. So there's some of the reasons that Mao had. Of course, if we dig deeper and ask, well, why did China want Tibet? There's all sorts of other things that we can point to, such as um, historical ideas about relationships between China and her neighbors. The fact that China for centuries has been an expansionist power, right? And has been an empire actually for much of its duration. Um, acquiring Tibet gave China for the very first time an international border with India. And as you all know, that border remains um, important for the two countries. And since 1962 has been a militarized border, right? So that did not exist before. There was no place where China and India shared a border, right, prior. Also, the headwaters of all of Tibet, uh, sorry, all of Asia's major rivers, continental Asia, are in Tibet. And you can kind of count them all off. The Mekong, the Yellow River, the Brahmaputra, the Yangtze, um, uh, go on, I, I'm, the Ganges, like I, I'm forgetting all of them now. I don't have the list in front of me, but if you look it up, you'll be astounded. And if you control the headwaters, right, then you can also control everything that's downstream, right, which involves, you know, billions of people. Um, Tibet is also a vast and underpopulated territory um, that had many resources that had not yet been exploited. Um, and sadly, we have to talk about that now in the past tense, because one of the things that China did was not just start mining, um, but also extracting logger, doing new, uh, logging, sorry, timber, um, and doing nuclear tests, All right? So in a very short period, you know, six to seven decades, right? Just 60 to 70 years, um, China's presence in Tibet has greatly changed things, but it hasn't just changed the landscape. Right? It's changed the lives of people and it changed their lives almost immediately, which is why the army um, that I'm going to be talking to you about today formed. So the Chinese People's Liberation Army first marched into eastern Tibet. That's where the border with, with China was, so that's where they went first. When they first got there, the soldiers had orders to be very kind to the Tibetans, right? Treat them nicely. Don't institute any policy changes yet, right? Like, make the local people your friends. And that's what they did. There's a saying that Tibetans have that, like, so many old men and women have said to me, and it translates into English as, the Chinese are like kind parents. The silver dollars rain down on us. Right. So the soldiers would go into the villages with bags of silver coins. Right. This was before the advent of paper currency and just give out money. Like, who doesn't want that? Right. And so the Tibetans thought, OK, well, maybe, you know, the Chinese aren't so bad. Maybe we can live with this. And then things changed. What happened was first um, attacks on any of the leaders, whether they were secular leaders such as chieftains or religious leaders 
right? Such as Rinpoche's or reincarnate lamas. Um, also in Kham, there were kings and queens. So royal families also, who I guess are somewhat of a blend between right, the sacred and the secular a monarchy. Um, these leaders were publicly abused. Then full scale attacks on monasteries happened. Right, including not just abuse of, of the monks or of the nuns, um, but the pulling down of statues, the burning of scripture, the dropping of bombs right by planes flying over monasteries. So real full scale attacks. First, um, Tibetans living in different villages just started fighting back just in their own house, like um, well, first from their homes, but then from their village, then from their, say, their district, right? Defending their families, defending their leaders. Then across villages, um, the word in Tibetan uh, is payu for district. So from different payu, from different districts, they started coordinating attacks. Okay, we're in this uh, payu of Litong, we're going to coordinate with Nyarong, and we're going to coordinate with Dege and with Mili, right? To fight against the Chinese and do a coordinated, coordinated attack on, you know, like the first Monday of the month. Eventually, however, and again, you can see um, before you, right, uh, one unit of the army, the Chinese army was just too powerful. And so the Tibetans eventually had to start moving west towards Lhasa. All right. And that is where often the story starts in Lhasa. But I want to emphasize that it first begins in eastern Tibet in the province of Kham, which is spelled K-H-A-M, if you haven't yet learned uh, about the different regions. So my research, um, which I began actually many years ago now. So this is research that dates all the way back to 1994. It's probably older than some of you are. Um, that's how long uh, research projects can unfold, right? So really, this is research I've been doing for almost 30 years. And that in part is because the story is not over yet, right? So even though much of my research was concluded in the, in the 1990s, the story keeps unfolding. So there are additional chapters that I have to add as time goes on. And the story also, of course, continues to matter deeply, right, to the Tibetan people. All right. So this is a history of the army, but then also an anthropology or an ethnography of the men's experiences of serving in that army. And then the story of their lives afterwards as they were no longer soldiers, but became both veterans and refugees, right? Often in the same kind of moment. What I argue um, in my scholarship and generally in, in, in a book I wrote is that the history of this army has been arrested. And what I mean by that is that some people know about it, but that in general, it has been agreed upon by the Tibetan community that right now is not the time to tell this story. And instead it is going to be arrested, right? Or put away kind of in safekeeping, we hope, right? Until a time in the future when it is convenient, right? Or appropriate to tell it. So I wanted first to know, well, why is it that this history isn't told? Why would you not tell the story of your fight for your country, right? Of the sacrifice that so many of your relatives have made, or maybe that you personally made of your service, right? To your country, to your family, your leaders, your religion, to his holiness, the Dalai Lama, right? Why wouldn't that story be one that you put front and center when you explain who you are to yourselves, and when you tell your story to the world. What I found is that there are four reasons. Three are very obvious. One is the CIA was involved. So the CIA is the you know, secret intelligence agency of my country, the United States. Anything involving the CIA is top secret. So you have that, number one. Number two, um, Tibetan Buddhism and Tibetan politics now, right, in the contemporary period, but not in the 1950s, rest on a policy of nonviolence. And if you commit yourself to a politics of nonviolence, it's very difficult to narrate a history of war, right? War and nonviolence don't go together. So that's something that also makes this history awkward. The third is that the Tibetans didn't win. And yet, if we actually right, go through history and look at different civilizations around the world, we still find all sorts of stories, right, of people telling the fight of, you know, the struggle for their country, even if they lost, right, they still hold up their heroes as people to emulate, right, including in the future. The fourth reason, however, is actually the most important, and it has to do with internal politics. 
So I want you to remember now that I said the fighting started in Eastern Tibet in Kham. The center of Tibet is Lhasa, right? And that's the capital. That's where the Dalai Lama is based. That's where the Tibetan government is based. That's where the aristocrats live. That is where that's like Uber Tibet, you know, like Tibet with a capital T. And for people from central Tibet, those folks from Eastern Tibet, they are not supposed to be running the country. They are not the ones we look up to for guidance. And so this army, right, that originated in Kham, that was composed mostly of people from Kham, didn't necessarily, they were both welcomed, but also not welcomed, right, by people in central Tibet, including in the way that politics and the organization of the government would later play out in exile, right, in both India and also Nepal. Okay. So regional identity and regional politics and exile politics actually end up right, being, in my estimation, the most important reason that this history has not been shared. It's what I call, following the work actually of an Indian scholar named Veena Das, one of the pains of belonging. And so both in life, but also in you know, academia, we often talk about how painful it is to not belong. Right, to be left out, to be excluded from something. But I want you to pause for a second and think maybe of the compromises you make so that you do belong, right? What are the things that you choose to do to be included, right? So that you're not left out. And so this arrested history is one of those pains of belonging where the soldiers, right now veterans, collectively consented to hold their history right, to hold their memories and to not make them public, right, in order to honor basically the wishes of their leaders, right, including the Dalai Lama. Okay, so the rest of the talk is now going to lay out this history and get to the question of those repercussions of like, what does it mean to make that decision, right? What does it mean to not share the story of the most important thing you've done in your life, the one thing you've done that is most meaningful, right? To hold that inside and to keep it private. Okay, here is a map of Tibet. Um, you might be familiar with where Tibet is in the world already. And now you can actually see all those blue lines, right? And so now you can see those rivers that I was talking about and just how many, right, are radiating out from Tibet um, into South Asia, West Asia, Southeast Asia, and East Asia, right? Just going everywhere. Um, but you see all the countries, right, that Tibet borders. And also here, you can now see how China prior, um, well, and anyways, we'll leave that. But just that's where Tibet is in the world. I also want you to get a sense of just how large it is. Tibet is the size of Western Europe, right? And while it's not as large, quite as large as China or quite as large as India, it actually comprises one fifth to one quarter, so 20 to 25% of China's land mass. Right, it's it's a vast territory. So even that, just adding right, twenty five percent of of China right is comprised of Tibet. So there's Tibet. You can see Kham on the eastern side, and now I want to show you a map of just Tibet. Um, and you can see now slightly better, like a more focused version of Kham. And now you can see that march to Lhasa. So Lhasa on this map is shown right, kind of directly above Bhutan. So here is your you know kind of map. Um, north of Kham is Amdo. This is the province where the current Dalai Lama, the 14th Dalai Lama is from. And there was also early fighting there in the 1950s. So there were also battalions from Amdo who joined with the Chushiganju army. And then there were also some battalions from Lhasa and from the central Tibet region who joined. Smaller in number than those from Kham, also smaller than Amdo. But truly there were people from throughout Tibet right, who joined in this army. There were also a couple of Chinese dissidents who joined in this Tibetan army, you know, who had formerly been part of nationalist China, the Republican army, um, and one of whom lived for the rest of his life until his death in India and was given a, um, a Tibetan name. His name was Jia Losangtashi, which means Chinese Losangtashi. And I believed he lived in South India, I want to say in Bailakupi, in one of the camps in, in Bailakupi. Um, but there's someone whose story hasn't yet been written. Right, but again, just thinking of who was part of this army, got as part of the, um, you know, thinking about that regional politics aspect that remains so important today. 
Okay, so I've already mentioned um, His Holiness, and here I want to pause for a minute um, and share with you a photo of him, and to also express just how important he is, not just to this story I'm telling you today, um, but to the lives of every single Tibetan who I know, um, who take His Holiness as one of their personal, um, it's like Depa, uh, religious leader in whom you put your faith and your trust, right? He is your spiritual uh, guru, right? Your, your teacher and your guide. So for those soldiers to defend, again, not just their families and their local lamas or Rinpoches, but also to defend his holiness, gave this mission a very, very special poignancy and importance, right? At the time of the Chinese invasion, his holiness, the Dalai Lama was a teenager. So he was born in 1935, and at the time of invasion, right, was 14. He had to become the leader of Tibet at age 16. Now, I know that we are all probably smart people in this, you know, in this class and, and doing good things in the world, but I don't know how many of us were ready at age 16 to become the leader of our country, right? That's a big job. Um, so he had at this very young age right, before he would have, right, had to take on this responsibility. And so his teenage years and early 20s, you know, the 1950s, were spent with him trying to negotiate with China, trying to find a way to take care of his people and to keep them safe as they were being attacked, right, by a foreign country. One of the things he did and please forgive the kind of crudeness of this. This is actually a page from, from my book, but I wanted to share it because I think it matters. Every single Tibetan soldier, right, who served in the Chushigandru army had a photograph of his holiness. So what you're looking at here at the top is the photograph of his holiness. And then the script on the bottom was the backside. So the top is the front image on which the back was written a letter from his holiness to the soldiers. Every single soldier carried this in an amulet that they had, um, that they carried on their body. And when you went into battle, um, well, first of all, Tibetans all, all wear amulets and protective cords just on their body in their everyday life. And this historically has been part of Tibetan culture. But going into battle, you would get special protections, right? Protection against death from bullets, protection against pollution by blood, you know, just general protection for taking on a dangerous mission. Right, and I'm going to now hold up um, the closest thing I have to an amulet within reach, which is my iPhone, <laughs> right? And it's important, right, that your amulet is actually on your skin, right, and worn close to your body. So knowing now, right, of, of the importance of His Holiness the Dalai Lama for the soldiers, I want you to think of having his words, right, on your skin, right, his image as, as protection. And I'm now going to read you, I'm not gonna read the entire translation, but a short excerpt of it. I just need to open to the page. Um, this is from my book, Arrested Histories. Okay, so I'm now going to read you the Dalai Lama's words. He writes, to all Tibetans from the three regions, our nation Tibet has been independent for thousands of years. The Chinese communists destroyed all the monasteries in Kham and started such practices in Usang also. Therefore, Kamta, Kampas and Amdoas revolted and settled in the Loka region. All Tibetans living in Tibet should unite themselves, avoid the Chinese communist deceptions and cherish our patriotism until Tibet regains its independence. I pray for those who lost their lives for Tibetan freedom and for those who are suffering. With the blessing of the three jewels and inexorable karmic consequences, we can trust that the sun of Tibetan independence and happiness shall soon rise. He wrote this letter in 1959, shortly after crossing the border into India. All right. And again, this was shared with the soldiers, right? And something that they treasured, right? Protecting. So again, trying to give you a sense of that, that deep connection, the trust and the faith, right? That Tibetans have in his holiness. I don't want to pause for a second um, and say, how did someone like me come to be doing this research, right? Who am I? <laughs> um, Tibetan woman. I, I'm a white woman. I, I am uh, not Tibetan. Um, I'm what Tibetans would call Inji, 
um, but also Ari, right, from America. And at the time I started this research was, was quite young. I was 25 years old when I started doing my research on Tibet. And what you see here before you is an image of Boda. Um, and so Bodhnath is uh, in Tibetan a Chortin, um, in Nepali, a stupa, perhaps the same word in Hindi. Um, I speak Nepali, I don't speak Hindi. Actually, I don't even know. A anyways, let's move on from Nepali Hindi conversation. Um, so a Chortin in Tibetan. And so this is a massive temple. And what you do is not just go to the temple and make offerings, but you do Kora, which is a form of walking prayer um, or walking meditation. Um, you circumambulate or walk around the Kora. And people will do this dozens of times every day, sometimes twice a day. This is where I lived while doing my research. So history tends to be about reading documents, translating things, going into the archives. I absolutely did that. But for a, doing a research project that involves history with people who are still living, involves not just reading documents, but also talking to people, getting their stories. And this is also the methodology of anthropology, right? So we call this participant observation. So going, um, doing interviews, observing people, of course, but also participating in life, right? So I would, um, doing Korah and studying religion was not necessarily what I was researching, but the people with whom I was talking about the war and talking about veterans' lives, this is what they did. They would go for Cora every single day. So I went for Cora every single day. And what I learned quickly is that Cora is as much a social endeavor as it is a religious one. It's where you see your friends, right? You check in, you chat, you walk together on the Cora path, and then maybe part ways. You stop and have tea. You talk about your life. You talk about your hopes, your dreams, your fears. So this photo before you is, is the most important site of my research to this day um, and remains my research headquarters. Right. While I was doing my research in 19, you know, starting again in 1994, I stayed with a family. So um, this is from that very summer. So that's 25 year old me, that's young Carol. Um, the father who you see there, um, his name is Lo San Tinli. He is from Litong. He was a monk at the time of the Chinese invasion at Sarah Monastery in Lhasa. He is the most devout religious spiritual person I know um, personally. And he like many other monks disrobed in order to join the army and fight. Um, you may not know this, but if as a monk you choose to disrobe, you can never again take your robes back on. So you cannot become a monk again. So you have to later in life just practice religion as best you can without the institution and the comfort and support of being in the monastery again. So again, that's how strongly um, he felt. Because, however, he was such a gentle and loving man, he, um, he was not a frontline soldier. And so if you think of all of the roles available in the army, right, there's all sorts of, um, you know, positions and actually occupations in the army. He was one of the supply guys. So he would dress um, in disguise as a Nepali and travel between different Nepali cities to buy supplies for the army, like wearing a Nepali topi and Nepali like lungi and these sorts of clothes and go down and, you know, buy oil and rice and spices and flour, like all the things that they needed that they couldn't get where the army base was, right? And go up and down and had to not be recognized as Tibetan, right? So again, what are the different positions within an army? Not everyone is an actual frontline soldier. Um, so this family also to just give you a sense of what it means to do anthropological research, um, ethnography, our methodology is based on relationships. I am still not just kind of in contact with this family. Um, we consider ourselves family now. Uh, so actually I'll be going to stay with them in Toronto in two months. So my research um, with this family, my learning from them and my living with them continues, right? Almost 30 years later. All right. Um, want to pause here for a second. So th this is the book I've mentioned a couple of times so that you can see the cover art. And I think this was, this was on the poster uh, that got that circulated over social media. But so the drawing on the cover was actually done by a Tibetan soldier. It's not something I drew. And it was done in a secret CIA camp here in Colorado, you know, the part of the United States that I am kind of coming to you live from. So from 1958 through 1964, the CIA trained a couple hundred Tibetan soldiers in a secret camp 
right here in my state. If you were here with me, we could all get in the car and well, maybe we all couldn't fit in the car, two or three cars. Um, and we could be there in three hours and do a tour of this camp together. But the drawing that you see there on the cover is what I described to you earlier. It's the, you can see the plane at the top bombing the monastery. On the top left, you can see a Chinese soldier pulling down a statue of the Buddha. Um, in the middle left are scriptures burning. Down below at the bottom, we have a Chinese soldier chasing a Tibetan monk, right, with a gun. And the middle of it all is a chortin, right, a stupa. And so this story right here, and this is also how I begin the you know, the book is that once they started bombing the monasteries and attacking religion, like that, that changed everything in that moment, right, for Tibetans, the, it was no longer, oh, they're giving us silver coins. It was they are attacking our whole way of life. They are attacking the things that are most dear to us. And that is when they began to fight back. So next, what happens <laughs> is um, the creation of an army, right, devoted to the Dalai Lama and to serving him. So starts originally again, just people rising up in their own villages, then in their nearby districts, then in their entire region, then the entire country is what happens. And so the text that you see here down below, these are the um, swords of Manjushri. So a lot of Buddhist imagery here, but on the bottom, the Tibetan script, what that says is um, it says, Do Kam Chushi Gangchuk. So Dokam is a name for Kam for the region. Chushi means four rivers and Gangchuk means six mountains. So four rivers, six mountains is an ancient name for Kam. And the army was given this name by Trijang Rinpoche, who was one of the tutors of the Dalai Lama and was himself from the region, right? So the army was named right, by um, this Rinpoche. In Lhasa, at the same time that they received their name, a man named Andrew Gompatashi was coordinating these efforts. So the man you see before you is a trader from Litang, which is a, a, a large and important payu or district in Kham in Eastern Tibet. Because he was a successful trader, he didn't just have business in Kham, however, he also had an office and a home in Lhasa. And just kind of a little footnote here, the Tibetan trade route basically went through Kham into China, um, through Darsendo or Kangding in Tibetan, I'm sorry, in Chinese, and then came down to Kalimpong. And so Kalimpong was the end of the Tibetan trade route in the Himalaya, right, in India's. Um, Kalimpong is kind of east of Darjeeling, you know, take the train up from, from Kolkata if you haven't been up there, another just lovely um, area. So Andrew Gopatashi is was a uh, excuse me was approached by a group of traders like small scale traders from Litang, who came to Lhasa to tell him that things were not going well in Kham. Right, we put up resistance, we're fighting back, but there's just too many of them. Right, the Chinese soldiers keep coming, and they have modern weaponry that we just cannot fight back. Right, we don't have the ability to fight back. He collects donations from all sorts of people, from all Tibetans, all walks of life. And people gave whatever they could. They would give precious gems, they gave money, they gave relics. And they created a golden throne that they offered to His Holiness the Dalai Lama in 1957 in a long life or tsering ceremony. His Holiness accepted this. And then in the summer of 1958, on June 16th, the army was formally inaugurated. At the time of its formal inauguration, Right? It went from being an informal citizen's army to a formal army devoted to His Holiness the Dalai Lama. One other important thing changed at that moment. And you might have noticed that up to this point, I keep saying men. There were also women involved. So women fought on the battlefield up until the point when the army was formally devoted to, his Dalai, to the Dalai Lama. At that point, per Tibetan cultural and religious protocols, it was no longer appropriate for women to fight. Um, the woman you see here before you, though, is Georgia Yudun. I've written about her numerous times, as has other people. Her story is phenomenal if you want to uh, you know, read more about her. Uh, she led troops into battle numerous times, very brave and valiant, but also unexpected, right? It wasn't something she thought was going to happen in her life, right? She didn't seek it out. The Chinese came to where she was. Same thing also for this um, brave and wonderful woman uh, known 
as Ama Ade. She actually just passed away um, during the, the pandemic, but lived in Dharamsala for many years after spending a decade and a half, I believe, in prison in China. Uh, so Ama Ade, her family name is Tapunzo. Okay, so here's an example of two women, right, who um, were very much part of the fighting again before the army became formal. One of the main accomplishments that the army had was to successfully escort His Holiness the Dalai Lama to exile, right? So they might not have defeated China in the overall war, right? And Tibet remains a part of China today. But the big success story that the army had is actually a magnificent one, right? They kept His Holiness safe. And the Tibetan writer um, and intellectual Jamyang Norbu claims that the entire Tibetan exile, right, refugee community would not exist were it not for Chushigandru, right? And their ability to successfully, you know, um, help the Dalai Lama on his escape. This is the training camp in Colorado uh, where the CIA trained the soldiers. What you see actually, it was originally a training camp for World War II soldiers fighting in Europe. And so the place where the Tibetans were training was actually back several valleys. It was not visible to the road and no Americans knew they were there. Um, if that kind of intrigue appeals to you, I've written about that too, and you can read it. There's some actual like stories of just how did this happen? How did they manage to do it right without being seen? Um, here's some photos of the Tibetans training in the United States. So again, this is um, just a couple hours drive from where I am right now, but I'm training there. Uh, you see here one of the American uh, teachers, one of the CIA officers, giving them a lesson on world history and on communism. Um, the uh, American man you see standing here was one of the only CIA officers who spoke some Tibetan. He posed as a, uh, I believe, anthropology graduate student at the University of Washington in Seattle and took Tibetan language classes. So I always joke with him, um, this is his name is Bruce Walker, that he's the reason why anthropologists are often, um, people suspect us of being CIA agents. So I blame Bruce. But you see here him speaking and the man next to him is Tashi Chira. Actually, it's not Tashi Chira, it's, uh, I think, Pedro, um, was one of the Tibetan translators. So there were a number of Tibetans who were fluent in English, and many of them had gone to schools in the Darjeeling and Kalimpong area, right? So there were many Tibetan families um, prior to the 1950s, you know, kind of the, the period of, of empire, right, attended those schools. I came from Lhasa to do that. Um, and then here also you see two soldiers sitting with one of the American teachers. This is part of the story I can't go into here, but one actually that I find very important, right, to talk about the relationship of empire to Tibet, right? So Tibet's relations to American empire, Chinese empire, and also to British empire. Now I'm going to switch to Nepal. So the photo you see now is after 1959, it wasn't just His Holiness who escaped from Tibet, but the Chushigandru soldiers also had to relocate. So they moved their, their kind of um, office headquarters, if you will, was in Darjeeling, but their military headquarters was in Nepal. And it was in a small kingdom called Mustang that actually sticks up kind of from Nepal into Tibet. And historically, right, many centuries ago had been a part of Tibet. So it's a Tibetan kingdom kind of within the country of Nepal. So this is where the Tibetan soldiers were based from 1959 until they had to stop fighting in 1974. Um, here's an image of soldiers in Mustang. Here they are cleaning their weapons, right, getting ready um, for a raid into Tibet. Um, and they continued to mostly do intelligence raids and kind of sniping missions to try and stop convoys. There were fewer um, uh, kind of one-on-one -on -one battles because if, if you we went back to that map, you would see now they're kind of far west. So they're west of Fossa now is where they are. So kind of away from the major population centers. The soldiers also, however, um, fought for India. And I don't know how many of you are aware of this that not just in the 1960s, but continuing to the present day, that there are Tibetans, right? And not just Gorkhas, right? Gorkha soldiers from Nepal who serve in different branches of the Indian military. So the young men you see on this image before you are part of um, what Tibetans call Tutu, Establishment 22, um, which I believe is part of the Ministry of Home Affairs. Um, but there's also the Special Frontier Force. And again, that's a separate lecture. Um, but for anyone who's interested, you know, kind of investigating, you know, who are these um, men and now also women in the context of contemporary India, right, who are not citizens of India, 
but who serve right in different um, branches of the Indian military. So I wanted to include that for you. And then come back to Boda. All right. So history is something that people live, right? History is, is, is alive. And while we're talking about contemporary history here, um, maybe you all in your own lives, right, can go back even further to, you know, where it's not even, you know, talking about grandparents or distant relatives, but people who lived centuries ago, and there's still a connection to that history. Maybe you personally don't feel it, but you could think of something like for your country, right, that's important for the nation, some moment or some actor. The history that I'm studying actually is one, right, that is still not just alive in distant memory, but, but in lived memory. So because I started this research so long ago, at the time that I, that I did it, many of the veterans were still alive. You know, now 27 years later, that's, that's no longer the case. So sadly, many of them have passed, um, not all of them. And, and those who are still around, I um, still kind of continue to, to talk with and try to get more stories from and information from and make sure that we can document as much as we can, right, while they remember it. But their children are here and their grandchildren. Right. And so as each generation learns the story and sort of comes of age, right, there's a new discovery of this history that has been arrested for so long and people want to learn it. And they are learning it often, not just Indian citizens, not just citizens of the United States, but young Tibetans, right, learning it for the very first time right, right now in 2022. Um, so truly, this is the story, right, that the world is still learning. So I see it as my job, right, is to learn their stories, right, to tell their stories. And here you see a picture of the Koda, uh, Kora path when, when it's very full, right? All of these people are doing Kora, right? That they're all there doing that. The veterans shared their stories with me because they wanted the world to hear them, right? They wanted you all to hear them and to know them. So coming to know people this way, right, it's not just coming to know a, a history in some sort of generic or abstract term, but it's to learn a history as populated by people, right, um, as people who care deeply about what happened, and again, who, who make compromises, right, in, in order to belong, in order to work towards a future that they think is good and that they think is right. So my goal here in my book, in my teaching, and you can see here, this, again, the left is the father of the family I stayed with, on the right is one of his dear friends who was one of the leaders of the resistance, um, one of the, the generals, so a very important man. In public, they just appeared to people as anonymous old men. If you saw them at Cora, you wouldn't know that these were heroes. And, and people would just write, you know, walk right past them, oh, it's just some old man doing Cora, or old man having tea, old man buying vegetables. Right, the arrest of history meant that the recognition of their contributions and their service, right, hadn't didn't come in their lifetime, and that was something that they accepted, right, that that might not happen. You know, their dream to return to Tibet um, also didn't happen. That's one now that has been passed on to the next generations. So, in conclusion, I want to end this Tibetan story of Tibet, right. As, as told in partnership with an American woman, with the words of, of one of the old men, one of the veterans, one of the soldiers with whom I spent a lot of time. And his name is Baba Lekshe. And what he said to me one day was this. He said, we fight for knowledge because without knowledge, you can only fight for small things. So I hope you take his encouragement, right? to keep seeking knowledge, right? And to fight for big things, to fight for the things that matter. And I'm so glad you're all taking this class on Tibet. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now so I can see some of you again. Um, and hopefully we have time for, for some questions. And thank you. Thank you, Carol. That was very moving, actually. I mean, uh, Many of us in this class are familiar with your work, but to hear you talk about it with the passion that you do and to bring forth the connections between your personal journey of research and what you were documenting and are still documenting, it's a different experience. Thank you so much for it. Thank you for sharing with us. Well, thank uh, you. Questions? Really... Guys, 
Anybody who wants to ask questions, can you just put up your digital hand? It'll be easier. If there's a digital hand in Zoom, I don't know. Is there? There is, there is an option for that through the reactions. Yeah. Anybody wants to ask a question? Okay, we don't have too much time, so I'm, going, I'm not going to wait too much for people to ask questions uh, if they don't want to go first. I'm going to volunteer on their behalf. Madhra, would you like to begin? Yeah, sure. I, uh, Carol, thank you so much. I think uh, I would echo what uh, Professor Sonika said as well. It was a really moving lecture and I really, really enjoyed reading your book when I read it the first time, um, partly because of what you described in terms of the kind of empathetic capture that you have of all of the voices that and all of the people and their stories that you've represented. Uh, one of the things that I was hoping perhaps you could talk a little bit more about was to kind of come back to the question of internal politics, both in Tibet and in exile. Mm -hmm. So in the book, you know, you talk about how the historic arrest is in service of building a particular kind of community. So I was wondering if you could mm -hmm. speak a little bit more about that and what that means for exile politics as it stands today. Sure, I'll try and give a, a quick answer. Um, and so for the students here, I have the book right here. Um, this book came out in 2010, but it's based on my PhD dissertation, which I completed in 2001. So basically, you know, the, this book is like 20 years old. And in some ways it's very, I'm very sad to say that the argument I make about internal politics, if anything, it is even more important right now, two decades later. So for a community in exile, right, in diaspora that's lost their country, how do you stay united, right? How do you stay uh, coherent, right? With a struggle um, that is where you can speak in one voice and yet still acknowledge the diversity that exists within the community. Um, that is incredibly hard. And so the two things that to this day, people try to argue against are regionalism and sectarianism. Um, you may or may, the class may or may not know that within Tibetan Buddhism, there are a number of different uh, schools. Um, and so just the same way that there are different regions, sometimes people will try and, and also um, you know, advance their school or, or um, privilege their school over others. So these are the two things that have been held up as kind of the evils in exile. And yet they're also the two things that are both near and dear to people. Right. Um, so Madhur, I, I can't give a full answer here other than to say this remains the biggest tension. Right. Is how do we um, as I'll speak, um, I guess, you know, as, as someone who, with whom I do my research, how do I on the one hand, right, um, articulate my politics and, and live my life as a Tibetan? right, given all of our struggles and our need to be unified, and yet also honor my family, right, my heritage, my teachers. And that tension is, we're back to that idea of pain. Um, so people try, but it ends up sometimes being very ugly. And these politics mostly are kept within the community. So to outsiders, it's often not visible, right, uh, uh, until, you know, a scholar, someone who's going in deeper and actually spending the time living your life there, then you start realizing, oh, wait, it's a little different than how things appear on the surface. And this remains one of the biggest challenges for the Tibetan community. We see it at election time. It comes out, you know, in the elections. Um, one of the ways that the Tibetan parliament in exile is organized is that people vote according to region and sect, right? The very things that you're supposed to not be, you know, kind of heralding. So it's one of those contradictions. Um, and one of my definitions of culture is that culture is a way to live with contradiction, right? And again, it plays out in this context. I see two hands here. Um, if one of you want to, to ask your question, that would be great. Uh, hi, ma'am. Uh, I'm Vijay. So I just wanted to ask if uh, uh, the Tibetan government is in exile, then how exactly are they fighting against encroachment of China? How are the Tibetans fighting against China now? Yeah. Okay. Well, since 1987, um, 19, in 1987, His Holiness the da Dalai Lama um, uh, debuted to the world what he calls his five point peace plan. And the idea in the five point peace plan is that the struggle for Tibet will now be entirely nonviolent right, and diplomatic. So um, it, it's an effort to try and negotiate with the Chinese government. 
He also said, we are no longer strictly seeking independence. Instead, we are willing to have genuine autonomy, right? And so it's an effort to try and work with the Chinese government, as well as to diplomatically reach out to governments of the world. Um, 1987 is now, what's that, like 35 years ago. Um, so it has not yet achieved the success that, that he had hoped, but the struggle continues. So that's the main way. However, inside Tibet, right, Tibetans inside Tibet have different strategies. And since 2009, 2011, one of their strategies of political expression has been self-immolation, which is a very um, dire, drastic and sad and incredibly bold and brave move, right, to set oneself on fire as a form of political protest um, and also religious, um, religious offering. So there are a number of ways, but there is no longer an armed um, military resistance. Okay, next. Lara, Lara, would you like to go ahead? Yeah, yeah thanks, ma'am. Uh, thank you so much for this wonderful lecture. Uh, I think I have a question that is a little bit personal, but I'll try and make it short. Um, sure. As a scholar of Tibet studies, uh, and you're trying to bring out the Tibetan experience to the world, how do you divide that from uh, what may or may not be your support of the Tibetan cause? And as a follow-up to that, mm -hmm. is the field of Tibet studies itself partially devoted to supporting the Tibetan cause? And how does that uh, at the same time keep itself as a, academic, as, as a space for academic study? Okay, um, those are excellent questions. So I can't speak for all of Tibetan studies, although you can talk um, with your professors and instructors here. They were just at the International Tibetan Studies Conference in Prague this summer um, and have participated in numerous things. And they can give you a lay of the land because um, there are different approaches. However, many Tibetan scholars, um, Tibetan studies scholars um, have a sympathy towards Tibet because they have a respect right, for the civilization, for the history, the religion, for the people. Now, let me come to the personal thing. And I'm going to do this kind of quickly. Um, I actually just published an article this summer. It's called Theory as Ethics. And it talks about this question. What does it mean to be an ethical scholar? What are the responsibilities, right, that we have in our scholarship? Um, especially for someone like me, right, who works with people, who people welcome me into their home. I sit down and have meals with them. I, I drink so much tea over the course of one day. At the end of the day, I'm like shaking, right? Um, because people are telling me about their lives and trusting me with their stories. And that is an incredible responsibility when you, your research is someone's life. So in anthropology and in ethnography as as a method, we actually reject the concept of bias as something bad. We said that doesn't exist. There's no way to eliminate bias, right? We acknowledge the humanity of the scholar, the positionality of the scholar, just as much as we do of the person whose story we're telling. And so we make our right presence part of the research, right? These people are telling their stories to me because I asked them, like, I can't deny that. I can't deny my transformation um, as a human being and not just as a researcher by the many stories, right? That I've, I've learned, not just of suffering, but also of joy. And actually that's a Tibetan definition of community, right? That community are those people with whom you share suffering and joy. So I encourage all of you to find that humanity in, in, you know, in your own practice as scholars and as students. Right, and, and different disciplines do have different understandings of bias in relationship to what it means to be objective. So what I do as an anthropologist might not be possible for you. You would have to think about it in terms of your own studies, right? How do you make sense of this? How do you, and also don't just accept what's given to you or taught to you. How do you redefine things as are needed now, right? For the world that we live in now. All right, do we have time for one more? Yeah, okay. we make this the last question. And I know many okay. of you have classes to go to. So uh, those of you who need to leave may log off. But those of you who can stay on, please do stay on. Yeah, Samaja, please go ahead. Yes. 
Thank you. Um, thank you, Kevin, ma'am, for like the lecture. It was amazing. Um, and I just wanted to know, like, um, distancing yourself from history is a very difficult task for a community. So, um, are there any like formal or informal methods to which they're, you know, trying to preserve it, perhaps not acknowledge it and celebrate it as such, but even just try to like pass it on to the next generations? Are there any formal and informal methods within the community itself who are trying to? Uh, just wanted to good question so when i first started this research um no <laughs> there were there were very few um but because i've you know, been around for a while now i'm happy to say that a number of oral history projects have started in the last decade or two um there's with two of my graduate students, I've been doing memory workshops where we go into communities and we bring the community together, not just the elders, but also young people, right, and share stories, right, kind of facilitate creating a space where people can share their experiences and their knowledge and, and, and their memories, because not everyone can write, right? So sometimes you can record, sometimes you just need to to, to share in a space without documenting it for, say, publication or dissemination. Right there, there's important work that can just be done in being together and listening. Um, so yes, those things that you're talking about, they're happening more now than than they did a couple decades ago, and I actually credit that to um, one of the biggest successes of the Tibetan community in exile has been universal education. So that was something that didn't exist in Tibet historically. The only schools really were the monasteries or the nunneries. So unless you were like super wealthy, which was like very small percentage, you only received an education if you were a monk or a nun. And now every single Tibetan child in exile receives an education. And so that is something that's really like a stark historical difference right between then and now. And that's one of the things that has made um, you know, with it, we're back to Baba Lekshe, right? With knowledge, you can fight, right? You know, for big things. With education, you can truly, um, you know, make the world anew uh, as needed for you and for your community. Um, I, it's, I, I wish I could be there in person with you all. It's, um, it's been really nice to, to talk with you all this mostly one directional, um, but I wish you all the best. And perhaps one day I will get to come visit you in, in Chennai, but good luck to you all. And thank you. Carol, thank you, I would like to, I would like you to stay on for one last question. If you have five minutes. <laughs> Sure. Anyone who needs to go, though, please, yeah, yeah. feel free. Yeah, they okay. they actually in their hostels, so they need to get out of the hostels and go to the classroom complex. So that's why I told them they need to they need to get on their way. But this is a question I think with regard to memory, uh, which probably mm -hmm. is not uh, uh, so much that people think about, is mm -hmm. what is the memory of Camp Hale and the CIA's operation. Mm -hmm. Um, with sure. the Tushit Andruk in the legislative community in the U.S. Oh, is the memory in the legislative community, very little. Um, this, this is an so important. if we had more time, I have, I mean, I have a whole, I even have images I could show you. I have tons. So quickly, quickly, everyone. Uh, in 2010, the day after my book was published, the CIA had a public ceremony at Camp Hale to acknowledge the Tibet operation. This was the work of one of the CIA officers who was retired and a U.S. senator from Colorado. And the CIA officer, um, his name was Ken Knauss, had worked on this for like 20 years. And the reason it's such a big deal is like the CIA does not acknowledge its secret operations, right? Like that never happens, right? Like they, they don't install a plaque somewhere to say here we, you know, assassinated someone, right? They don't do that. So this is a really big deal that in 2010 at Camp Hale, the US government installed a plaque to say at Camp Hale, the CIA trained like, you know, several hundred Tibetan freedom fighters who were fighting for their country. Um, so that exists. Now, there are absolutely legislators in the US um, Congress who are Tibet supporters. Tibet is one of those issues in the United States that tends to draw both conservatives and progressives to it, right? It, it draws folks who are anti-communist um, and it draws folks who are human rights supporters, right? So it really, we say in the US, brings people together across the aisle, but people who have very different political sensibilities um, can agree on Tibet, that Tibet is an issue that we should support. Uh, knowledge of Camp Hale is probably low, though. You know, the, the details are, are, are sketchy, um, but there is an overall support. However, um, 
overall support does not mean full willingness to stand up to China, right? That's kind of where the line is drawn. Yeah. So there is no institutional mechanism to keep people uh, who are part of the support Tibet support caucus in terms of, you know, familiarizing them with the history or this is fairly informally done because there was a Tibet No, so th there is. So there's a Tibet office in DC um, and that is, uh, initially was a special branch of um, of the Dalai Lama's office, now is independent, but that office has been in existence, I want to say, since the early 1980s. And so that office is specifically charged, as is the, now there's a formal office of Tibet in D.C., similar um, to what you would find in other countries. Um, those offices are charged with informing the U.S. government. Okay, but that's from the Tibetan side. That's from the Tibetan side, yes. Okay. Okay, thanks. Thank you for that. Thanks. Yeah, and I welcome. must I must thank Carol for taking out time so late in the evening uh, for an early <laughs> riser that she is to interact with us and to share your work with us so unreservedly. Uh, this has set the tone for what hopefully we will explore more in the in the in the course as we go forward. And uh, I hope we'll get you to come to Chennai in person and also maybe to return for <laughs> another lecture, if not this semester, then next semester when you have time. Thank you so much, Carol. Yeah. And thank oh, you all. That for, sounds wonderful. Thank you all for sticking thank on. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye.